We're really here just to thank the Monkowski family for funding this lecture series and for funding a series that's very much in honor of a person in their family who's obviously very important, uh, a wife uh, and uh, uh, an extraordinary politician and a mom and so many other things. And her daughter, Rachel, is going to introduce her to you momentarily. Uh, I also want to say hi to their grandchildren who came. So Raven, I love your name. As I told Raven, my kids are named Apple and Arrow. So I love, I love the names. Uh, Hannah Luisa, uh, and also Daniel, raise your hand, Daniel, who just started at UCSD in computer science a couple weeks ago. So we're really honored to have you here. Uh, without further ado, Rachel, I'm going to hand it over to you for brevity on my part. If you want to say a few words about your mom, please come on up. that matter. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so I have a couple of pictures to share. I'm Rachel Bonkowski. I'm super happy to be here introducing this lecture series. Um, so my mom, I think, was born as a traveler. And also, because she took us everywhere, and I think at this point, I never want to step into another cathedral or castle again in my life. Um, but she also um, was someone who had this amazing intellect and brain for history and facts and politics. And so in a lot of ways, the Foreign Service was kind of the perfect career for her. And she became a diplomat in the mid 80s. Um, and so here's a couple of pictures of some travel exploits over the years. So this is a early picture of my parents and then a later picture of my parents, um, I think the the first one is self-explanatory. The second one is taken in Vienna. Um, and my mom was both sort of intellectually, I think, perfect to become a diplomat, but also had this real uh, want for service and also a real belief in our democracy that she wanted to uh, further in her career. And I was, you know, 10 when she joined the Foreign Service. So for me, her career was about new schools every couple of years castles and cathedrals, um, and kind of wonky talk about politics and foreign affairs that mostly went over my head. Um, until I went um, in the mid-90s, in 1995, I was a senior in college and um, thought to spend my Christmas in Serbia, which is not the usual place one goes for Christmas, but my mom was posted there and it was after the Serbo-Croatian War had kind of died down, but it was as things in Kosovo were heating up. And, um, you know, what I was really interested in as a senior was I wanted to sleep during Christmas vacation and I wanted to eat home-cooked meals. So when my mom said, hey, Rachel, tomorrow we're going to Kosovo and you need to look nice, I was like, what? You know, that sounded terrible to me. Um, and so she found a blazer for me from her closet and then we piled in, and so this is me in the center, this is my mom, and then we had this kind of entourage with us. I'm pretty sure my dad took this picture because he came down with us. And um, the uh, interpreters, drivers, and as you can see, we're also holding a gas can because you never knew where you were gonna find gas or if you were gonna find gas for the trip back. So I was not thrilled. I think you can tell by my body language that I was not thrilled about this trip. And we got down there, and this picture is not the best quality, but we had this amazing time. And for me, it kind of was this moment of me being a bit more of an adult in understanding my mom and her career. Um, and we met with uh, Dr. Ibrahim Rigova, who my dad is here with. And he became the president of Kosovo when Kosovo finally gained its independence. But he was an amazing human being, which I was able to tell even just briefly in meeting him. And they were so happy that my mother was there. Um, they were so happy that the US was sort of having a presence in Kosovo. Um, and I, you know, I, I was still along for the ride. You know, we had a great dinner and we got to meet a lot of people that were working to form this fledgling government in Kosovo. And then as we left, my mom stepped aside with Dr. Rugova and another gentleman, and they handed her an envelope. And then we got in the car and we headed back up to Belgrade. And I turned to her in the car and I said, Mom, what's, what's in the envelope? And she said, well, I have to warn you, these are pretty graphic. And she pulled out pictures from the envelope 
of um, bodies, essentially, um, that had been uh, harmed, mutilated, killed by Serb forces in Kosovo because the Kosovars were Muslim. And she said, I have to take these to Congress in the spring. And she did. She went in and spoke in front of Congress and delivered the pictures. And she, she remained very invested in the human rights uh, issues going on in Kosovo and helped support the NATO presence there uh, when NATO did intercede in 98. And so for me, this was also this, just this moment for me of really understanding my mom, that she wasn't just kind of this wonky person who could win at Jeopardy, but that she was really doing service for people and really um, uh, trying to do her best for human rights across the globe and to further democracy. So I think our hope for this lecture series is that it captures that essence of both sort of the understanding the geopolitics of what's going on, but also really capturing that heart and soul that I think my mom brought to service. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Hafner Burton. That was beautiful, thank you. I'm gonna be very quick, but I want to just do a quick run of shows so you know what's uh, happening before I, there's 10, before I introduce our uh, keynote speaker for the day. Um, so first of all, I wanna thank you, the members of the public and community for coming. It's incredibly important to us that we have the opportunity to, to have these discussions together, and so we're really glad to see you. I wanna thank my colleagues for showing up and being here. I wanna thank the staff, especially from the School of Global Policy and Strategy who have worked double over time to make this happen and we're grateful for all of your uh, work and assistance. Afterwards, we're going to be having time for some Q&A. We'll be having a reception, which you're all invited to, right across the way so we can continue that conversation as well. So without further ado, what I would like to do is introduce Ken. Come on up here, Ken Roth. Quite an extraordinary individual. Former director of Human Rights Watch, so many of you may know him uh, that way, currently a visiting professor, soon to be a professor of practice perhaps, uh, at Princeton University, uh, and a man who really knows um, anything and everything about human rights, about criminal justice, uh, international criminal law, and so forth. So Ken, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. You're so great. Okay. Your mic. Can you hear me? Let's work. Okay, good. Okay, um, Emily, thank you. Um, thank you for in inviting me, um, and um, Fred and, and, and Rachel and the family. Um, I just feel very honored to be able to be, you know, offering this first inaugural um, address for your wife, your mom, um, your grandmother, <laughs> and um, you know, it, it just I, I feel like I guess I'm an appropriate choice because I feel like I'm following in her human rights tradition. You know, she was. Um, an official, you know, she pushed human rights within the government. I tried to push governments from outside to, to do the right thing on human rights, but it's very much a, a parallel, cooperative, complementary effort. So I feel um, honored to be um, giving this first lecture, and, and thank you very much for, for making it possible. Now, I should say that, um, you know, these, the topics have to be prescribed in advance. I didn't anticipate that Hamas was going to launch this you know, horrible attacks on Saturday. So that's not what my talk is about, but I do want to say that I'm happy to talk about it um, during the Q&A, um, or for that matter, anything else on your mind. Um, but um, this is obviously something that's very um, concerning, preoccupying all of us. So I'm, I'm happy to go there, but I'm not going to address it in my opening remarks. Um, what I am going to talk about is this global contest between democracy and autocracy that has been you know, kind of very much a, a dominant force, um, a key topic of conversation in many capitals around the world. And there is a common wisdom about it these days, you know, that autocracy is ascendant, that democracy is in decline. And I think that that is an oversimplification. Indeed, if anything, it's wrong. And I'm going to try to explain why that is. Now, you know, I don't deny that autocracy is a very serious problem, and I'll, I'll go through you know, a few of the best, the most visible autocrats out there in a few moments. Um, and they are doing what they can to you know, make the world safe for autocracy. But if you kind of put yourself 
in the shoes of the autocrat. It is a hostile world out there. And their plight is much less rosy than the common wisdom would, would suggest that we believe. So I'm not saying that you know, we should just be complacent and go home. Um, there is a struggle out there. But it is a struggle that is winnable and that, um, in my view, the autocrats are in trouble. So that's my, my, my premise. Why do I say that? Um, first of all, if you think about you know, what is autocratic rule, it's you know, some typical strong man, I mean, sometimes women, mostly men, who have all the answers. You know, they, they surround themselves by sycophants. They um, prohibit free debate, you know, let alone dissent. Um, they are just you know, going to sit there and make decisions by themselves without the benefit of the free input of information and free discussion about what the right thing is to do. And if you think about it, that is a recipe for bad decisions. That's how you make big time mistakes. How do we know this? Well, you know, today exhibits A and B are the world's two most prominent autocrats, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. So let's look at these guys. Vladimir Putin, you know, sitting in his COVID-induced isolation, you know, reading Russian history books, you know, not letting anybody talk to him with any independent point of view, comes up with this brilliant idea that he can you know, resurrect the Soviet Union, you know, reestablish Russia's grandeur as an imperial power, and invading Ukraine will be a cakewalk. Just a few days, and they'll take Kiev. Now, you know, this was a disaster. It was a disaster, obviously, for the people of Ukraine, but it was a disaster for Russia, too, where you know, they now are really in economic trouble. Um, all dissent has been crushed. Um, you know, he's clinging to power as a matter of desperation. Um, you know, this, I don't think anybody thinks that Russia is better off today than it was in February 2022. Or take Xi Jinping, who is, you know, much better at portraying his rule as a success. You know, nobody talks about the Russia model. You know, nobody wants to kind of replicate the, the kleptomatic autocracy of Vladimir Putin. But um, you know, Xi Jinping is out there promoting the China model. You know, this is how you can be a dictator and um, flourish economically. But let's you know, look at the China model a little bit more closely. Um, you know, first of all, you had um, the COVID disasters. You know, had the Chinese government covering up the outbreak in Wuhan, um, denying that there was human-to-human -human transmission for the critical three weeks when millions of people you know, fled from Wuhan or traveled through it and gave us a global pandemic as a result. You then had him think, oh, well, you know, the way to solve this is with my you know, zero COVID lockdowns, which he stuck with you know, way past Omicron, way past it became clear that you know, the, the virus was much too contagious to contain through these lockdowns, you know, with enormous economic consequences, enormous personal sacrifice for the people of China. And when suddenly there were mass protests, you know, not just against the lockdowns, but against Xi Jinping, he suddenly reversed himself with zero preparation. So he never bothered vaccinating older people, because who needs to do that because zero COVID was going to work, right? You know? And he never bothered investing in the intensive care units that were suddenly overflowing with very sick people. He never allowed the mRNA vaccines to be imported, because that would have been a front to great Chinese nationalism. And it was a disaster. You know? Now, officially, you know, only 86,000 people died from COVID. In fact, the best estimates are that it was about 1.5 million. But it's not just you know, COVID. If you look at you know, how he is um, handling the economy today, he's been attacking the most vibrant sectors of the economy, the tech sector, because these people were getting too powerful. They were a challenge to his power. And his top priority is, is maintaining that, you know, that dictatorship, that uniformity of power rather than a flourishing economy. Um, you know, most people today say that um, China needs 
um, more consumer spending to get past its stagnation. But um, he doesn't like that because he doesn't want people deciding how they spend the money. He wants you know, government-directed investment um, in more and more infrastructure, even though you know, there are enough bullet trains to nowhere and it stopped being at all um, you know, a, a productive place to invest. You know, he's overseen this, this huge debt crisis in the real estate sector. Um, the local governments that have tended to, to shoulder the burden and are themselves overly indebted. Um, and you know, one of the great Chinese Communist Party legacies, um, the one child policy, has left this huge demographic problem. So you know, suddenly the China model doesn't look so great. They're stagnating. So let's look around the world and see how other autocrats are doing. Um, you have um, you know, the, the Roger Poxes of Sri Lanka or, or Sisi of, of Egypt who um, you know, trumpet the wisdom of their rule but can't help resisting in these vanity projects that ruin their economy. The Roger Poxes you know, wanted to build a huge port in their hometown, except nobody needed a port in their hometown. So you know, the Chinese ended up kind of recuperating the port, leaving the country in, in, in huge debt. You know, CC is building this, this enormous new capital outside of Cairo that nobody but him thinks is needed, while you know, people can't even afford bread anymore. So you know, these are the kinds of decisions that autocrats tend to make. You know, Erdogan, the only person in the world who thinks that you fight inflation by lowering interest rates. Um, you know, he thought it was a great idea to give building code amnesties in earthquake zones because it would make him popular with um, contractors, except then an earthquake struck. You know? So um, this, is, you know, this is what you get when you allow the strongman to make decisions without the benefit of free debate. Now, this is not to say that democracies make only wise decisions. We all know that. But democracies at least do have the benefit of the free input of information, vigorous debate, dissent. And so you at least you know, have more of an opportunity to correct if um, initial decisions are poorly made. Now, you know, given this poor governing record of the autocrats, they have um, traditionally recognized that they can't just hold an election. You know, they're too likely to lose. But traditionally, what they would do would be to manage an election. So they would you know, tilt the playing field just enough so that they would win. So you know, just silence a few um, opposition media channels, you know, lock up a handful of opposition figures, you know, shut down a few civil society organizations. Nothing too radical, but just enough to ensure that on this tilted playing field, you would prevail. Um, and you know, some autocrats do still survive managed elections. Viktor Orban in, in Hungary, um, Erdogan in Turkey, you know, have, have recently won in those circumstances. But, but these days, most autocrats don't even risk a managed election. They have now resorted to what you might call zombie elections. So they completely you know, arrest all of the opposition figures. Um, it's like, you know, Ortega did this in, in Nicaragua. Or they, um, you know, make sure that there's only one candidate who, you know, is allowed to compete against him who typically endorses him. Or they, you know, completely silence the media or they shut down civil society. Um, they, you know, ensure that there is no debate, that there's no real choice before their people. And so, you know, you see these zombie elections proliferating. Um, this is what you know Hun Sen did in Cambodia. It's what um, you know Museveni did in Uganda, where he would literally you know have his security forces shoot people at opposition rallies. You know, periodically lock up Bobby Wine, his leading opponent. Um, you know, I mentioned this is what Ortega did. Lukashenko locked up everybody. You know, really shut down the country um, in order to try to win. Um, he didn't, didn't count on the wife of the leading opposition figure taking his place and winning. So then he just like, you know, pretended the election didn't happen and he, he called it his way. Um, you know, Putin obviously locked up Navalny 
and, and prevented any serious opposition from, from competing against him. You know, Navalny's real offense was coming up with a, a system to elect the least bad candidate who was not from Putin's party. Um, and that was, you know, so embarrassing that he had to be, you know, first they tried to kill him and then they, they locked him up. Um, this is, you know, what um, the Iranian clerics did in, in, you know, not allowing even any moderate figure to run for president. They had to pick this guy, Raisi, a, you know, a, a former executioner as the only one that they would trust. Um, this is what the Thai junta did. They basically, you know, packed the, the, the two legislative bodies so that even when the opposition candidate won, he didn't really get to become prime minister. Um, this is what you know, Hong Kong did when, when the real offense of the opposition there was to hold a primary to determine who their single candidate would be because that candidate would have beaten the pro Beijing candidate. So that had to be wiped out um, along with all of Hong Kong's freedoms. You, know, you can go on and on and on. This is, this is how they do it. And so you have to say, you know, what's the point? You know, at least with the managed election, you would get a degree of legitimacy from the exercise. But these zombie elections are just charades. They don't confer any legitimacy at all. They really are just designed to tell the people of the country, you know, look, we held an election. It kind of, you know, silences a bit of opposition at home, but nobody is fooled. There, there is no legitimacy that emerges from, from this exercise. And so as a result, you see, you know, diminishing appeal of autocrats. And I say this not because, you know, this is just my personal belief, but I say it because when you look at the reaction of people in these countries, in country after country, massive amounts of people are taken to the streets in opposition to autocracy in favor of democracy. And so, you know, we've seen this, you know, very recently in Iran, um, you know, the, the Nobel Peace Prize just went to, to you know, one of the inspirations of those protests. Um, you know, we saw it in Sudan that led to the overthrow of Omar al-Bashir. Um, we've seen it in Uganda, in Hong Kong, in Myanmar, in Russia, Belarus, Cuba, um, Nicaragua, you know, many, many places. Now, these, you know, obviously don't always succeed in ousting the autocrat. You know, sometimes it works, um, but often, you know, because the autocrat maintains a monopoly of force, um, they're able to crush um, the opposition. But it becomes a very risky enterprise because it's difficult to govern for the long term simply at the barrel of the gun. You know, autocrats really need a broad degree of popular acquiescence. And if they've lost that acquiescence, if they can't even, you know, pretend that there was an election and that they were the people's choice, um, this is, you know, a difficult situation to be in. And that is, you know, what we see today in so many countries. You know, that's what Putin is facing in, in Russia. That's what Lukashenko is facing in, um, in Belarus. You know, that's what, um, you know, the, the Beijing pawn government of Hong Kong is facing. And so, in a sense, you know, we have to watch the juries out in terms of what actually happens here. But it's a precarious situation. It's not a, um, a positive, you know, welcoming situation for these autocrats. Now, let me, um, if I could say a word about um, the United Nations, because that is an important forum for the defense of human rights. And um, I think it's interesting because it shows a bit about the tactics of these autocrats, because they want, obviously, not simply you know, to win these pseudo elections at home. They also want the acceptance of the international community. And that becomes you know, particularly important in a place like China, where they don't even allow elections. You know, because if, if Xi Jinping can say, you know, look at, I'm an accepted figure. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, these UN institutions treat me as an important, legitimate leader. They can you know, reflect that back home and try to bolster their legitimacy on the home front. And so the UN ends up being an important forum for these contests over legitimacy. And it's interesting to watch how some of these leading autocrats treat the United Nations. Um, you know, Putin has not been very effective. Um, his main strategies have been one to just, you know, play complete games with the facts. I mean, he was like really the, the originator of alternative facts, you know, and, and for Putin, um, you know, no lie is too blatant to tell. Um, and the point is actually not really to persuade anybody who's going to look too carefully. 
but it's more just to give a fig leaf to those who, you know, for whatever reason, want to kind of buy into Putin's rule. And this could because, be because you know, they're anti-Western and anti-imperialism. You know, they um, may just you know, benefit from Russia's arms or from you know, Wagner mercenaries or what have you. But there are, you know, there are people out there who just kind of want something to hide behind um, in continuing to support Russia. And so his you know, fact, just playing with facts is how he does that, even though it doesn't fool most people. The other thing is that he does is he is a master of whataboutism. You know, like, why are you focusing on my abuses? You know, you have that, you know, you did that. And, you know, and if, if you watch, you know, RT, it's all about, you know, all things that go wrong in the West, you know, so like why pick on Russia? None of these are terribly sophisticated strategies and they have really not saved Russia to date. Um, so, you know, the General Assembly has several times condemned the invasion, you know, condemned the annexation. Um, they they um, suspended Russia, or kicked Russia out of the UN Human Rights Council, although actually tomorrow Russia's trying to get re-elected to the Human Rights Council, amazingly, which is a rather audacious move. Um, you know, Putin has now been charged by the International Criminal Court. I mean, things are really, you know, not going well for Putin so far in the international domain. China is another matter. And China's approach is more sophisticated. Um, you know, like every government, China has to pretend that they respect human rights. But China's strategy is to redefine human rights. And this is different from kind of the classic Cold War arguments about you know, civil and political rights on this side and economic and social rights on that side. Um, China doesn't want any of those rights enforced. You know, they obviously don't want you talking about civil and political rights because there are none. You know? But they don't even want you talking about economic and social rights, which you know, the old Soviet Union used to promote. Not respect, but promote. Um, but they want you, um, you know, the problem with economic and social rights is that it, it asks, are you allocating available resources to benefit the worst off segments of society? And that is not a welcome question for Xi Jinping because then you have to ask, you know, well, what about the Uyghurs? You know, what about the Tibetans? What about rural Han Chinese? You know, there are lots of people who are not um, getting allocated their fair share while, you know, Xi Jinping invests in, you know, huge security forces and in a highly intrusive surveillance state and the like. And so instead, what Xi Jinping wants to do is to redefine human rights as being, in essence, one thing. Is the economy growing? You know, is GDP going up? Now, this is, you know, a radical dumbing down of human rights because it means, you know, no say about uh, who is ruling your country, but not even any say about how those resources are allocated. Just the big picture question, is GDP per, per capita going up or down? And that was a comfortable question to ask Xi Jinping, at least until recently. I mean, they, you know, the economy is still growing, but it's growing less quickly. And if, if suddenly it were to start shrinking, he'd be in big trouble. But um, you know, this is his effort to really rewrite human rights law. He also wants to change the way human rights are enforced at the United Nations, because the UN has developed a system to put pressure on governments that don't respect human rights. They have you know, special investigations and reports and evidence collection and condemnation and all these things that abusive governments hate because it delegitimizes them. It, it gives the opposite message to what they want to show the folks back home. Um, he would like conversation about human rights at the UN to be a nice, cooperative, gentle affair. How do you support human rights? So oh, that's nice. We support it this way. You know? And so he wants you know, sort of nice, chit chat, you know, no condemnation, with due respect for every government's or civilization's approach to human rights, civilization defined by the dictator. Um, so again, these are you know, really quite radical propositions. And then to make it worse, Xi Jinping had this $1 trillion Belt and Road Initiative, which was supposed to be an infrastructure investment program, but really was an effort to buy off autocratic leaders around the world to vote with Xi Jinping at the UN. Um, and it was designed to have zero transparency, zero popular input. 
it was basically an invitation to corruption. But that was fine, because the people who were gaining the corruption were the exact officials who would then determine what the vote at the United Nations was. So you know, this is um, the approach that China's been taking. Now, you know, it has been able to avoid condemnation at the UN, although the last time we tried to put China on the agenda just a month ago, or a year ago, for um, the atrocities against the Uyghur in Xinjiang, we lost by two votes. So it was very, very close. Um, we've been gradually putting together joint statements condemning what's happening in Xinjiang, and are now up to 50 governments. Um, you know, at first, people were very reluctant, but now they've become more comfortable. Um, China, um, four years ago, barely made it on the Human Rights Council. It came in fourth out of five candidates for four spots. Saudi Arabia lost. Um, if there had been one more candidate, China might have lost. Tomorrow is running with no opponents, so it, it will you know, win. But now we're kind of looking at how many votes does it get. But China is looking a little vulnerable despite all of these efforts. And we will you know, keep pushing this. And I should say that despite, um, you know, despite these autocratic efforts to manipulate the UN Human Rights Council, it continues to work in many important countries, you know, whether Syria or Myanmar or Eritrea or you know, Sudan. I mean, it, it, it is still an important place to investigate, to report on, to condemn, and to pressure governments that violate human rights. So this is, you know, this is the world from the perspective of the autocrats. You know, they don't govern well. People see through it. They don't secure popular support. Their efforts to manipulate the international system to give them support is precarious at best, or in the case of Putin, not working at all. Um, so that's why I say it's not a great world out there from the perspective of the autocrats. But I, I'm not going to stop there, because I don't want us to walk away from this and get all super complacent and say, you know, done. You know? Um, because, I don't need to tell you this, but we have problems in our democracies, too. And so let me just spend a few moments on that. Um, and let me just begin with the fact that for um, in many, in fact, almost every democracy these days, we are finding you know, autocratically inclined politicians who are kind of ripping up basic democratic principles. You know, they are often um, undermining elections. You know, the Trumps and Bolsonaros of the world, they've never seen an election that they didn't win. Um, they are attacking the checks and balances on executive power, you know, trying to undercut the judiciary, limit the role of Congress, silence the media, quell civil society. They are um, typically sending anti-rights messages, you know, exclusionary appeals, demonizing some unpopular minority. It's almost always migrants. Sometimes it's Muslims. Often it's LGBT people. Um, and this is, you know, pick somebody who your kind of conservative base dislikes and just throw rights out the window, throw, show no leadership, attack these people. You know, that's, that's the approach of these autocrats. And their appeal is working uh, for a certain segment of society, not because they are delivering for these people, because they almost always don't have an actual program um, they are, you know, they're just very good at appealing to people's emotions, their, their sense of, of cultural grievance and the like. Um, but what they, I think, for the most part are appealing to are people who feel left behind by the system. So not necessarily the poorest people, but people who feel that they are being passed by, neglected, you know, disrespected by the governing elite. And these are people who are you know, not happy with the status quo, not happy with government, and are willing to listen to the, these autocratically inclined politicians' program of just upending the system. You know, and those are, you know, that's Trump's base. You know, that's Marine Le Pen's base. Um, that's the AFD in, in, in Germany. You know, and, you know, if you look around, it, it, they tend to be very similar people. Now, if you look at the foreign policy of Western democracies, there we are also not seeing a vigorous defense of democracy. 
Um, you know, Biden during his first couple years in office actually talked about democracy a lot. He talked about this contest and he's pretty much stopped. And the reason he's pretty much stopped is because he's not living by democratic principles in his foreign policy. Um, if you just, you know, look at the last few weeks, I mean, Biden is certainly, he sees Russia and China as the two big threats. But he stopped defining this as a matter of autocracy versus democracy. It's just pure geopolitics. And so he's running around the world bolstering allies that are autocratic themselves. So he just you know, had a new diplomatic relationship, a kind of heightened of relationship with Vietnam, despite its you know, hundreds of political prisoners. Um, he just struck a new security relationship with Bahrain you know, even though Bahrain has completely imprisoned the entire Shia opposition. Um, he just approved $235 million of military aid to President Sisi in Egypt, ignoring the human rights conditions that Congress had attached to that, um, even though it turns out that the Egyptian government was bribing, as alleged to have bribed, Senator Menendez, the, at the time the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. None of that has stopped the money going forward. You know, in many ways, the worst case of this is the Saudi crown prince, who you know, epitomizes autocracy. I mean, he's a monarch. Um, but you know, Biden obviously went there first, you know, did the whole um, fist bump thing, just to try to you know, get a, a smidgen of more oil to kind of fight inflation before the midterm elections. You know, now his utter fixation has been um, you know, a, a Saudi-Israeli normalization deal. Um, you know, obviously the fighting in Gaza is gonna make that more difficult. But, you know, the irony is like the big questions were, so, you know, what, you know, token concessions were the Palestinians gonna get to cement this deal? And it seemed to be, okay, you know, a bunch of cash to the highly corrupt Palestinian Authority and a tiny amount of land transferred from Area C to Area B in the West Bank, and that was it. You know, nothing of significance. Um, and, you know, and, and we were suddenly looking to the Saudi crown prince to improve the, the fate of Palestinians. I mean, this was kind of crazy. But um, that was you know, what had happened to Biden's human rights program. It's just been, you know, it's been abandoned. The European Union is no better. The European Union's fixation these days is stopping migration across the Mediterranean. And so the European Union is paying you know, billions of euros to various countries to block migrants. They first did that with Erdogan in Turkey. You know, then they were funding the Libyan Coast Guard to pick up migrants and bring them back to these nightmarish detention facilities in, in Libya, which you know, the European Union knew were so awful that they didn't dare send anybody there themselves. They just paid the Libyans to do it for them. You know, now they're proposing a deal to Kais Saeed, the, the you know, coup leader in Tunisia. Um, his method of migration control has been to take black Africans and dump them in the middle of the desert. And they're gonna pay him to do this. So it's not like we're getting you know, sort of great leadership from Europe either. And what worries me is that this has now you know, transformed the you know, genuine concern about Russia and China into a mere geopolitical contest. It no longer is a matter of democracy versus autocracy. And you know, this is fine for the autocrats of the global south whom Biden has been courting. It's not what the people want if you judge by you know, the, the, what they've shown themselves by taking to the streets or by trying to promote democratic reform in their countries. So I feel, fear that it's you know, a very short-sighted um, approach that is treating um, democracy as an end, but not a means, which is not a, a viable formula. So you know, what to do? Um, clearly, in terms of foreign policy, there's a need for a much more principled approach. You know, yes, sometimes you do have to make compromises, but Biden seems to have just you know, abandoned what he said would be human rights as a guiding principle of his foreign policy. That's just gone. Um, in terms of how do you um, bring people back within our democracies to understand the importance of democracy. That's not easy. 
you know, obviously at some level, at the philosophic level, we want people sort of thinking in Kantian terms. You know, we want to treat others the way we ourselves want to be treated. But a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people think, I'm in power, I'm gonna dump on the other side. You know, or, you know, there's a more pragmatic argument. You know, if, if, if you allow their rights to be abused, it's only a matter of time before your rights are gonna be abused. And, you know, this is an argument we often make with LGBT people. You're like, okay, you, you know, in a conservative society, you may feel you can dump on LGBT people, but it's just a matter of time before civil society more broadly is gonna be attacked. And we sort of see this progression very readily. And this is, you know, a pragmatic argument that can work with some people, but what we found is that the autocrats are now trying to um, just kind of redefine the community and, and say, well, you know, what you say affects the rights of people within this community, but these people don't belong. They're not part of our community. And there's an effort to really carve out people. So that's, I, I think, a challenge that we need to take on. Um, all of this is going to take, you know, real leadership. And I, I can't say that I, I see this leadership um, if, as I look around the world. You know, I mean, sometimes Macron speaks in these terms. Uh, it's just very hard to find it. You know, Biden was more inclined to speak that way, but has stopped. I think Anthony Blinken, when they let him go, can speak like this. But you know, he doesn't make these decisions. They tend to be made in the White House. He's just the Secretary of State. Um, but I think what we need is you know, somebody who not is just you know, making the right decisions, but is providing this kind of moral leadership to rebuild a broader national sense of community where there's recognition of the need to, um, to respect the rights of everybody. But I also think that just at a very pragmatic political level, we need um, politicians that understand how to give respect even to people who feel left behind. And you know, Trump's brilliance, he, he you know, has no program that benefits these people, but he is very capable of speaking to them genuinely with respect. I think because he shares their resentment of the elite. Um, and that is, I think, something that we can learn from Trump, which is that you know, everybody deserves that respect. Everybody deserves to be heard. You know, this idea of you know, the Hillary Clinton deplorables, I mean, that's a huge mistake. You know? And so I, I do think that you know, if you look at the Democratic Party, they've got to find a way to move beyond their base to stop speaking to the choir, and to speak to people who are deemed as hostile, but to speak to them in a respectful way to hear them. They may not always agree, but I think that that is going to be a prerequisite to um, turning around this tendency to just follow some autocrat to upend the system, which increasingly is what these people are doing. Um, so I think this is all doable. Um, as I said, I think the, the autocrats are in trouble, but we have some real work to do intending our own democracy as well. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Ken. That was great. Uh, we have lots of time for Q&A. We have two different ways to do that today. So for those of you who feel a bit shy and don't want to stand up and put your question uh, verbally, you can put it on a note card. Uh, and we'll read it and have, uh, have Ken uh, talk about it. He'll, they'll be handing out note cards in this direction. And then for those of you who would like the mic, you're welcome to have that as well. Mic or note card, sir? Thanks very much. Um, so I make the connection better for me because uh, uh, I know all about how bad autocracy is, but I also, as you say, I'm quite concerned about democracy, and certainly as it's been practiced here in the US, as is a lot of the world. And so we're not doing a good job of advancing the notion of why democracy is preferable to autocracy. It sounds like, and I know this is your, your area, but it sounds like you're saying, let's be more respectful of human rights, and that's somehow going to move people in the direction of democracy. Um, but I don't think that's enough when you have the experience we've just gone through and may in fact be going through again in what is viewed as uh, the best example of democracy in the world. So, yeah. No, when, I, when I say you know, be more respectful of human rights, I mean this in terms of foreign policy. In other words, it's hard to promote human rights if you're cozying up to dictators left and right. You know, people see through that hypocrisy in two seconds. But in terms of domestic policy, democracies have to show that they can deliver. 
you know, that's really their, you know, ultimately that's their advantage over autocracies because autocracies claim that they deliver better. You just, you know, bring in a strongman. But in fact, when you, you know, look more closely, they're pretty bad at it. So I think, you know, we can spotlight where they fail, but we have to do a better job on our side in, in actually delivering. And the, and I think it's not simply a matter of, you know, delivering goods. It is also a matter of making people feel that they're heard, you know, this respect side. Because I think without that, you still will have people who, you know, because in today's world, I mean, fortunately, you know, most people are not starving, you know, and, and they are not at a point where they necessarily need, you know, um, financial benefits from the government. Um, they've, th this kind of intangible of respect is pretty important to people and is guiding people's votes, you know, more than economic welfare at this stage. And I think we just have to be attuned to that and not think about, oh, it's just enough we're handing out government benefits. We've got to learn to kind of speak to people who are you know, disinclined to support us, but to do it in a way that they feel heard. Next question, Ken, is the following. I love this question. Will AI promote autocracy or democracy? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, AI obviously you know, can be a tool of surveillance. Um, and if you, you know, if you look at what um, the Chinese government has done, particularly in Xinjiang, where, you know, it is this, you know, huge database they put together. They, they you know, have these handheld devices where they input pages and pages of information on each Uyghur. Um, and they have QR codes in the home so they can just like flash the code and see, you know, who lives there and what their background is and, you know, are they doing suspicious, anything suspicious that warrants detention, like, you know, wearing a beard or praying too much or having, you know, um, contacts abroad. So, you know, that shows sort of the evil that, um, you know, AI can underwrite. Um, but it obviously, you know, also can advance our lives. You know, it can make things more efficient. It can, um, you know, I, th I think it can, you know, help us all live better too. So. I, I'm not a troglodyte. I don't think you, I mean, first of all, you can't put it back on the box. It just never works that way. Um, but it also, you know, I, I do think we're going to, we, we need to develop, you know, a whole new range of ethical standards because, you know, if you, you use the, you know, chat GBT or whatever, it's giving you information, but you have no idea where it comes from. And, you know, so I think we need to, um, you know, figure out ways to guide AI. But overall, I think, you know, you don't squash these advances. You got to live with them. And, and they clearly have a lot of positive potential. Thank you. Which of the existing democracies in the world do you think are doing the best job and why? Yeah, no, that's a hard one because I, you know, people often ask me like, you know, so who's your model? And I don't know that I have one. I mean, on, on immigration issues, I think it's Canada. Because you know, for whatever reason, they have um, developed still a very largely positive view of immigration, um, despite having you know quite substantial immigration numbers. And I think they've um, you know it, it's a lot having to do with leadership. Um, you know, people just talking about this as being part of what Canada is, and people you know see the economic benefits of that. Um, they've learned to live with a pluralistic society. Um, you know, I wish we could replicate that in, um, in more countries. The, um, but obviously there, there are different, you know, elements of, of the, you know, there, there's, you know, there's the homophobia, there's um, the Islamophobia, you know, this pops up in, in um, the Islamophobia really more in Europe. I mean, it's less of an issue here, but it's a big issue in Europe, but of course the numbers there are bigger. Um, the anti-LGBT, uh, you know, homophobia pops up, um, you know, in sort of selected, more conservative countries. I mean, not in most of Europe, actually not mostly in the United States. I mean, and even here, it's, these days, it's become much more focused on trans people than on, you know, I mean, same-sex marriage, things like that have become almost mainstream now. You know, there is a tiny minority that opposes it. But it's hard to um, figure out, like, you know, what is the ideal thing? I mean, I, I spent part of my time in Switzerland, which is sort of known as this, you know, kind of local rule place, and it, you know, it has this very decentralized government, and you know, all of that kind of works, but it still has, you know, a big 
anti-immigrant right-wing party that is you know, in and out of the government. So I don't have a simple answer to you. I think this next question follows nicely. How do we preserve democracy in the United States when our core institutions, Senate, Supreme Court, Electoral College, et cetera, are structured in a way that effectively enables minority rule? Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, it, we tend to grow up in this country and say, oh, we have the best system and, you know, um, this is the model of democracy. In fact, you know, the US Constitution is, is very old. And among, you know, charters in democracies is probably the oldest and has big problems. You know, there's no single perfect system, but if you look at, you know, parliamentary systems, they tend to kind of force government, force parties more toward the center. You know, you, you don't get this complete cleavage in the same way as, as you do in sort of first past the post systems, um, you know, like the UK or, or, or like the US. Um, the, I mean, the minority rule is, um, I'm not sure that that's a fixed thing. I mean, that is the, I mean, the Senate is an unfair institution, you know, where you just get, you know, two, two seats regardless of what your state is. You know, California is the, the biggest victim of that. Um, the Electoral College obviously um, is influenced by that. But, you know, the Electoral College cuts both ways. I mean, if you have, the, you know, these huge states like California and New York that are just automatically Democratic or Illinois. I mean, you know, the Republicans feel that they're at a disadvantage with the Electoral College. Um, the, you know, the gerrymandering that has made the House so um, difficult to move, you know, so many seats safe, um, could be remedied if, um, you know, the courts were a little bit stronger in insisting on more neutral line drawing. Um, I've been, you know, pleasantly surprised that a few like incredibly racist gerrymandering things like Alabama have been thrown out, you know, even by the court system now. And that the Supreme Court has, you know, I think probably because they just were so stung by their abortion decision, has, you know, been backing off a little bit and has been, you know, kind of pushing a little bit more in the direction of racial justice when it comes to gerrymandering. So, you know, that, you know, there may be some modest fixes there. But I don't, um, you know, I wouldn't say that this is in a minority rule. I think that there are elements of the system that do benefit minorities. I mean, the other thing that is kind of, you know, odd is the filibuster, um, because that allows, you know, minority stymie, um, if nothing else. But, um, you know, these are, we still are getting, you know, pretty regular alternation of power. It's not like we have an entrenched governing party. So the idea that there's just a minority that's running us, um, I don't really buy. You know, there are elements of the system that are like that, but I don't think it dominates the system. Thanks for coming, Ken. Uh, you touched on the um, uh, issue of the credibility of, of the US when it comes to, to human rights. And I was wondering, which are those spots around the world where maybe we in the United States have, are part of the problem when it comes to, to human rights and um, either as uh, indirectly or directly or as an accomplice where, and where we might have uh, some more personal responsibility to try to address as well because of that? Yeah. I mean, look, if I looked around the world and say, you know, where, where is the biggest gap in US human rights policy, it would be the Middle East. You know, the, the, the broad principles are, these days are just abandoned. And, and I mean, as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, that's, that's true for, you know, you know, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Israel, certainly. You know, so there's, and the, the reasons vary. You know, it, it's, I mean, Israel, I think it's really more domestic politics. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, it's, it's oil and, and, you know, the crown prince has been very good at playing off the China card. Um, you know, Egypt, it's still this, I think it's partly being grateful for the peace made long ago with Israel. Partly, you know, Sisi's viewed as stable, even though I think this is, you know, a very precarious stability. Um, but it's just, and I, a lot of this is also informed, I think, by, you know, the post-Mubarak experience in Egypt, where the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, ran and won. And even though, you know, Morsi was, you know, hardly great, 
he was not a disaster. You know, this view that, oh, he's making another Iran, he's another Khomeini, is just not true. Um, you know, Sisi is so much more repressive than Morsi ever was. But there is this kind of dominant view that you can't trust Arabs with democracy because they'll vote for Islam. And um, this is a view very much promoted by the Emiratis and the Saudis, but it's one that seems to have kind of caught on in Washington. So they don't push too hard. They don't really want democratic rule in the region. Um, they're kind of happy with pro-Western autocrats, and that's what we're stuck with now. Um, I did want to get your uh, reflections on the uh, Hamas-Israel situation now. Okay, nice simple question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, okay, I mean, let's just, you know, let's begin with what Hamas did on Saturday was despicable. You know, I mean, they, you know, if you look at that music festival, I mean, they just went and slaughtered people, and they killed 250 people. I mean, it's just, you know, these are just civilians. So that you know, was just blatant, blatant war crimes. The seizing of, you know, of, of many civilians, you know, women, kids, and bringing them back to Gaza as hostages is another war crime. So you know, let's just start with that. I am not a defender of Hamas. Um, what I worry about now is that you know, this was just such a challenge to Israel. It's such a, you know, a, a, a shocking moment that um, you know, Netanyahu, I'm afraid, is just going to unleash the military. And even sort of said so much. I mean, he didn't say it's okay to commit war crimes, but he sort of said We're, there are no limits here, you know, which is not how a leader should speak. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, we're going to throw everything we can at Hamas and we're really going to try to, you know, wipe out Hamas. I mean, fine, you could say that. But to, you know, to say we're going to kind of wreak revenge, to have the defense minister say we're imposing a siege, which is blatantly illegal. I mean, you know, we're going to deprive you know, the civilians of Gaza, which is already blockaded, of any access to humanitarian aid, to water, to electricity, you know, this is not permissible. They've already, you know, taken out four of Gaza's biggest apartment buildings, which is something they've done in previous wars as well. Um, now, you know, they always say, oh, there was a, you know, a Hamas office someplace. They typically have some answer like that, which is irrelevant because when you're destroying, you know, 100 people's homes, you need a big military reason to do that. Otherwise, it's a disproportionate attack and a war crime. You know, um, and we're seeing you know, various cases, like you know, today a, a market was killed. We don't know if that was, you know, it was hit. We don't know if that was a mistake or deliberate. But you know, very quickly, the civilian toll was rising. And what I worry about, and people are saying, oh, this is you know, Israel's 9-11. But we should remember what happened to our 9-11. You know, in our 9-11, America, you know, was completely had the moral high ground. Everybody's heart went out to us when the, the World Trade Center towers fell. And within three years, we had lost that moral high ground because Bush invaded Iraq. He was engaging in systematic torture. He was detaining people endlessly without trial in Guantanamo. And, you know, committing, you know, abuses in the name of fighting terrorism is a losing battle when it comes to global opinion. And, and Israel, I think, is, could, it's going to go much more quickly. You know, they are at risk if they are seen as just, you know, retaliating to the loss of their civilian life in kind. And whether it's deliberate or whether it's just indifference, it sort of doesn't matter very quickly because people are just going to see the numbers. But as the numbers of civilian dead mount because Israel has impunity from the sky and can just keep bombing and bombing, um, they're going to lose the moral high ground very, very quickly. And a ground war, which seems you know, a distinct possibility, is only going to aggravate the problem because, um, I mean, there will obviously be many Israeli soldiers' lives that are lost. Um, that's what happens in war. But I worry about you know, the many Palestinian civilians that would die in that process. So we're at a, you know, a moment where if there was you know, kind of forceful expression in Netanyahu that you know, this is horrible what happened in Israel, um, of course you have to respond. But respond lawfully. That's one message. If it, the other is just, you know, do what you have to do, we're with you, you know, that's another message. And, and I'm afraid that it's that latter message that is being heard and certainly, you know, the way Netanyahu is acting. Yeah. 
How you doing? Hi. Thank you for the information. It's very insightful. It has my mind in Wonderland. Um, I have a question. This thing between um, autocrats and democracies is really strategic. And most importantly, I speak for the little man. So I'm asking you, if there is a one topic that you could get someone who may not be aware of the tension between autocratic and democratic forces, what would that be that would encourage them to address the facts? Yeah, I mean, to put it you know, in kind of less abstract terms, I think it's basically, you know, do you want a government that is answerable to you or not? That's what it comes down to. You know? now, obviously, you know, none of us has the capacity to, to determine what the government does. But collectively, we do in a democracy. Um, you know, there's that level of, of public accountability that doesn't exist in an autocracy. So I think you know, the basic question is, you know, what, is, what kind of government is most likely to serve you? If it's a government that's deciding on its own what's important, I'm pretty sure it's going to serve its Swiss bank account and its cronies. You know, if you want somebody who's going to do something for you, you've got to have somebody who's willing to allow you to speak and try to influence it. That's what it comes down to. That's, that's what democracy is. Um, autocracy tries to prevent that. Great. Here's another one from the cards. You haven't mentioned India, world's largest democracy. Yes. Please comment uh, about Modi's leadership. Yeah, no, I should have included. I mean, if you look at sort of what, what are the kind of anti-democracy things that Biden has done in recent years, you know, one of them was to give Modi a state dinner, you know, state visit, you know, this honor that very, very few people get. Um, why? You know, because he's seen as a key counterpoint to China. But this is despite, you know, his extreme Hindu nationalism, which is leading to violent attacks on Muslims throughout India, is despite his, you know, incredibly thin skin. And so his silencing of critical media, his, his attacks on critical civil society, particularly environmental and human rights groups. And so, you know, why do you embrace a guy like this? You know, because of China. But this is not a human rights policy. This is just pure geopolitics. Perfect. We have time for a few more questions. You brought this up, media. How does media play, what role should media play in supporting our democracies? And why aren't we doing that now? Well, I mean, media um, is critical for informing us about what government is doing, you know, about the policy decisions it faces. And it's essential for critiquing government. And in a sense, it's an avenue for us to influence government as well. I mean, these days we have social media, so we can make ourselves heard through social media um, if there's kind of, you know, a real kind of um, something that goes viral, you know, you'll be heard. But usually politicians only hear traditional media. And so you've got to try to you know, get heard through, through journalists. So I think that that you know, is an essential part of democracy. I mean, I, I should say that you know, some, one classic ploy of autocrats is to define democracy as just the election. And then they try to manage the election. But um, it's, of course, more than that. The election is a requirement of democracy, but it's just one element. And you, you know, in between elections, how do you influence government? It's through the media, it's through protests, it's through civil society, it's through these various ways to kind of, for people to make themselves heard without having to go to the ballot box. And that's essential for democracy. So that's, you know, kind of the key role that I see media playing. What's it not doing I mean, I, th I, I wish there were, I mean, look, I think that if you look in the United States, you know, what's the big problem with media today? It's actually local media. You know, we've kind of lost local media. Um, and that's, you know, there are economics for that, behind that. But, you know, we've also lost too many of the national papers. I mean, if, you know, it's really the national papers have come down to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. And that's it. You know, I mean, the LA Times doesn't really exist anymore. You know, there are this series of kind of once strong regional papers, you know, Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, Philadelphia Inquirer. They're all just, you know, skeletons of what they used to be. Um, and, and so this, and because the economics of local papers 
really you know, he doesn't support the local papers, there often is very little scrutiny of how local governments or even state governments sometimes are operating. And if you accept that media scrutiny is essential to have accountable government, you, you know, we're actually doing a worse job at the state and local level than we are at the national level, where at least there are these strong national institutions. Hi. Hi. Um, we've been talking about the, in general, the, um, uh, whether the autocracy or is, and democracy is better. But would you agree or would you think that autocracy would be good for a country at any at a particular point in their history? Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly thinking of China because mm -hmm. over the last 40 years, um, China's made remarkable progress in their economy. Mm -hmm. And if you'd ask the uh, local people there, they're perfectly happy, maybe up till now, mm -hmm. with the, the government that was in power at the time because they were enriching themselves during that, the last mm -hmm. 30 years. Let's yeah. um, let me answer your question, a good question, in two parts. I mean, um, one is that you know, it is a mistake to just sort of rush to elections. That if a country is emerging from dictatorial rule and has no independent media and no civil society and no political parties, um, having a rush to election is not necessarily smart. It often will produce just kind of an elected strongman. You know, so I do think we have to recognize that you know, democracy is a gradual process and you've got to build the foundation. Um, you don't just, don't treat elections as just you know, the immediate goal. Um, with respect to China, you know, yes, indeed, under it happens to be the Chinese Communist Party has been ruling, and over the last 40 years has been this amazing growth. Um, they were starting from a very low base, the Cultural Revolution, which that same Chinese Communist Party caused. Um, there is a big debate about what's responsible for this growth. You know, some of it was wise investment. I mean, I think clearly the government was investing in infrastructure um, and, and you know, brought China up to world class in that sense. But um, many people who look at China say that it's actually the Chinese people who did this. And it was the Chinese government getting out of their way, you know, removing the constraints of communism that enabled a very entrepreneurial people to flourish. And I don't, you know, there's no real empirical way to prove that one way or the other. But I don't you know, necessarily accept that you know, autocratic rule is the best route in China given its disastrous older history um, and you know, its current dubious governance. You know, so I, I think it is quite unclear whether China's gonna escape the middle income trap. Um, one interesting thing to do is to, you know, what you say is you know, that's the kind of Xi Jinping line. We, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, brought this amazing progress to China. But look at Taiwan, you know, part of China or Hong Kong for that matter, um, each of those territories um, you know, also started low, but has far surpassed China. These are now upper income countries or regions. You know? um, and so you actually have done better with democracy than with autocracy. I think that is part of why Xi Jinping had to shut down freedoms in Hong Kong, and it bodes poorly for Taiwan's future too, because these are just real ideological challenges to this Chinese Communist Party narrative. Ken, this will be our last question right. before we go to reception where we can hopefully continue this conversation and you're all invited to join us for that purpose. I think this is a provocative question, so we're gonna end on this one. It's interesting, I'll be curious to see what you say. In developing countries, we human rights advocates mobilize and support local NGOs and human rights groups. When the political trends turn towards authoritarianism, the local actors get blamed as foreign agents. Do you think that our support does more harm than good? Yeah. Um, you know, the, I mean, one of the ploys of the autocrats is to suggest that opposition is foreign. You know, that, that the indigenous population really loves the strongman. You know, and, and you see variations on the theme, and that's one explanation for political opposition. It's an explanation for, you know, why do you have LGBT people? Oh, that must be a foreign imposition. You know, there are no real LGBT people in our country. You know, or, um, you know, why do women want to lead independent lives? You know, why do they want to drive? Why do they want to, like, be able to make their own decisions and not have their husbands make their decisions? Oh, that's a foreign imposition, you know? And you, you, you hear this all the time. 
Um, I think the best antidote to that is to you know, find ways for the local population to speak in its own voice. And you know, that, that's certainly true for you know, minorities or for women, but I think it's equally true for kind of you know, mainstream um, political people who are just representing what the people of that country obviously want. And so I, you know, it is unfortunate that it's too dangerous in many of these countries for local wealthier people to fund the local human rights group because they'll get arrested or they'll get their businesses you know, facing retaliation. Um, so it is true that most of the funding comes from abroad, but the sentiments are very local sentiments. You know, everybody wants to have a say in their government. You know, nobody wants to face unfair trials or censorship or, or torture or abuse. So these are you know, really universal sentiments. And finding ways to highlight local voices to say that, I think, is the best antidote. Perfect. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time for this part of our discussion, although, again, we'll continue. I would be grateful if you would uh, join us in thanking uh, our speaker today for a really provocative discussion. And I was going to give you a big hug. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I also would like you to welcome uh, and join me in thanking the Bakonsky family for making this possible. So I'm looking at all of you here. Thank you. It's been really wonderful. This will be the first in a series uh, based upon their generosity. So there'll be more to come. We'll be contacting you for those of you who are interested to see some of the other things we'll be doing. Christina, where are you? I also want to thank my partner in crime, uh, who we run the Future of Democracy initiative together across the state of California, and she's um, been intimately part of this and has been helping with the cards. Um, uh, and thank you to Rachel for making those beautiful comments about your mom. It was really nice. With that, we're going to adjourn. Our reception is available to everybody who's here, and the conversation can continue. Thank you.